All right, welcome to another non-gameplay video with Rug Delver. Today we're going to be talking about how to pilot the deck against Merfolk. Now, Merfolk is kind of a polarizing matchup for us. Not in the sense that people often call Tron a polarizing matchup, because if you're an aggro deck, usually you're very good against Tron, whereas if you're a mid-range deck, usually you're almost certain to lose against Tron. That's definitely an exaggeration. Matchups aren't actually that bad, but it feels that bad. Merfolk's not quite like that. Merfolk is polarizing in the sense that some people think it's an even to good matchup, and I've seen a lot of, or at least I've read a lot of opinions that it's a pretty bad matchup, and I think that's because you can get punished a lot in this matchup. Merfolk is definitely skill intensive, we need to know what to hit, when to hit, kind of like in fact, but not nearly to that extent. It's really just difficult, and things can go not our way very easily. I think it's probably about even, but it could be slightly unfavorable. I don't think it's slightly favorable. It's definitely not favorable or extremely unfavorable, but I think I would lean towards the unfavorable side just because it feels difficult. That's the thing about Merfolk. When you lose, you feel like you really lost. When you won, when you win, you feel like you scraped by. Which is actually a lot how our Tron matchup is. And Jund, and a lot of decks actually. Probably because we're a tempo deck and we get by by the skin of our teeth. I'm pretty sure that's the expression, but it always bothers me because teeth don't have skin. At least I don't think so. Pretty sure they're just bone. Anyways, Merfolk. What you want to do against Merfolk is... Basically, like against every other deck, establish a clock, sooner rather than later, play a Delver on 1, maybe a Goyf or a Mandrills on 2, I guess you could play Knuckleblade on 3, we're gonna get into Knuckleblade being basically one of the worst cards in our deck for this matchup. You wanna play a clock, you wanna kill their lords, maybe counter something if they don't have Aether Vile or Cavern of Souls going. Denial, maybe something that would try to remove your threat, and close out the game. Basically our standard plan. Uh, what Merfolk is going to try to do in all of this is... Well, basically they're a tempo deck too. But they're a fish deck, whereas we're more of an aggro control deck. Fish conveniently is named after Merfolk. Fish is more of a deck where they play... A bunch of small creatures which individually aren't great, but they add up to a sizable clock, and their creatures also happen to be disruptive, so they can afford to run more. Our deck runs 15 creatures, which means we have basically a maximum of 15 threats, whereas a fish deck would have quite a bit more, and our decks notably, our decks, our threats notably can close out a game pretty much by themselves. Aberration's a good clock, Goyf's a good clock, Mandrills is a good clock, Knucklebladez a good clock, Snapcaster Mage isn't a good clock, but it's not really a threat. The body's more of gravy. Snapcaster Mage is more of a closer kind of thing. You want to use it to finish off the game its body. It's not doing the, the legwork. We're not playing twin here. We're not gonna sit back for 10 turns just barely getting enough of an advantage for our 2-1 to, to just squeak by. We want to go hard, we want to go fast, we like the big clocks. A fish deck runs a lot more threats, doesn't have singularly great clocks. A Lord of Atlantis isn't nearly as powerful as a Tarmogoyf. When you have three Lords of Atlantis, well, that Tarmogoyf looks a lot sadder. When you have a Lord of Atlantis and, say, a Curse Catcher, that's pretty nice. Lord of Atlantis, and something disruptive, a Tidebinder Mage. That's very good. That's one of the things that is good against us. Merfolk basically gets by sort of as a threshold it's going to kill you. It needs to have enough threats on board to basically win the game because it needs usually at least a Lord or just a few threats. Or a Lord and a threat, that kind of thing. Usually it needs at least one Lord, but it can get by if it has just enough regular threats if they also line up their disruptive elements on those threats properly. For example, we want to close out the game by playing, say, a Goyf, and then Mana Leak, Denial, maybe Snare something, Bounce a Thing, Bolt Face, 
and hopefully cantrip into more disruption if need be. Possibly play another creature to sit back and block or to get in the red zone with our initial threat. That's our game plan. Merfolk is going to curse catcher on one, assuming they don't have Aether Vial, which, just so it's out there, uh, because it's basically one of the most important things in the matchup, their hands when they have Aether Vial are so much better than their hands without. You almost always want to shoal the Aether Vial. Disrupting Shoal is so good for that. Um, if they start off on a Curse Catcher, we play a Delver. They play, say, Lord of Atlantis, swing in for two with the Curse Catcher. We bolt the Lord of Atlantis after on our next turn. Maybe they play another. Maybe they play a Mirror Regiri. Turn four, they play a couple two CMC spells. It's very difficult for us to remove all of their threats. We don't need to remove all of them, though. We just need to remove enough of them. You want to prioritize aiming your removal at lords, and you also want to basically hit enough of their stuff that they don't have enough tutus to just kill you. Because we don't have a lot of creatures, like I mentioned. We don't do too much blocking. And on top of that, if they have a lord that isn't Mirror Regiri because the other lords give Island Walk and they have at least one threat, they can chip in anyways. They basically just need a lord plus any merfolk to be able to get by our blockers. And, like I was saying originally, if they just have a few guys, we probably don't have enough to block. So, even though their guys are small, a lot of their creatures are 2-1s and 2-2s. Curse Catcher is just a 1-1. One -one. They're going to be chipping in, and sooner or later, that's going to be a sizable clock. So even if we draw a couple bolts, we kill a couple lords. If they have a couple power, say, four power worth of creatures, we can still die in not too many turns. Which is basically, probably, uh, I'm using a lot of adverbs here. I think it's one of the things that adds into the matchup being difficult. It's hard to remove all of their threats, and they can give them Island Walk, which means we need to remove even more of their threats, and they can disrupt our threats pretty well. Vapor Snag can slow us down considerably, buys them two combat steps, one for the initial bounce and another one for when we replay the threat. We don't have too many lands, so... If we do replay the threat immediately, maybe we want to save on turns, we probably, well, not probably, we do often interact and play threats pretty well, but there's a decent chance we won't be able to interact on that turn that we're replaying the threat. Vapor Snag is good in our deck. It's also not too bad against us if the opponent has a good tempo game shaping up. Dismember definitely lines up against our threats. Takes out Delver and Mandrill's Cold. Goyf might survive it, but probably not. One of the things I absolutely hate seeing out of their deck is Tidebinder Mage, because it taps down our fatties. And we like our fatties. Any green or red creature, it just holds down forever and ever, amen, as long as it's on the battlefield. So if your opponent has a Tidebinder Mage, you probably want to aim at that as well, in addition to the Lords. Another creature you definitely want to watch out for is Kira Great Glass Spinner. Kira is exceedingly hard to deal with, especially in game one. You basically have to burn two removal spells just to get rid of it, and they still get to keep their lords, because you just use two removal spells to deal with it, which means their other creatures have two fewer removal spells to deal with. Usually, I'd say you do have to take out the Kira, but if you're way ahead, you can probably ignore it especially if you can use those two spells on a more important creature and then just close out the game, or if those removal spells have to be, happen to be bolts, if you're far ahead enough, you can just aim them at the face. That's probably a good spot for making mistakes, and I'm sure I've made mistakes there before. Um, it's really just a hard matchup because we're both playing tempo decks, which means there are lines all over the place. Do I play my Delver? Do I hold my Delver so that I can shoal with it? Do I tap out on turn 2 for Goyf? Do I hope in, do I hope to hold up Mana Leak? Maybe I go for some end to turn bolts. Maybe I want to cantrip, fix our hand a little bit. There are a lot of lines, and they're pretty murky. 
So I think that's why Merfolk is such a troubling matchup. It's definitely not easy. It might be favorable, it's entirely possible, but I definitely don't think it's an easy one. Then again, most of our matchups against fair decks aren't easy. Against some of the unfair decks, I would say they're easy. I love going up against Storm. Burn is one of the matchups I also enjoy quite a bit. A lot of combo decks we are very good against because Clock plus Disruption. Against fair decks, that's not nearly as good because the fair deck also wants to interact. And they're not playing A plus B or Threshold combo. If you leave a couple of their threats around, just like if people leave a couple of our threats around, sooner or later the game's going to end for the person with creatures on the battlefield. Aether Vial, like I mentioned earlier, is very, very good for them. It lets them get way ahead on tempo. They basically just get to cast two spells a turn, and one of those spells is immune to counters, which is absolutely fantastic. Also, that spell has flash, which makes Aether Vial amazing. It is definitely a priority shoal target. And I have lost games against, or I've lost at least one game against Death and Taxes before, where it was, I think around turn 3 or 4, they were land light, and I decided not to counter the Aether Vial, because I figured I'll just save the counter for their actual spells. Well, that came back to bite me pretty hard, especially because Aether Vial means that there are fewer things you can counter, because they have ways around it. So I do think if you have a shot to shoal, leak, or denial an Aether Vial, generally you probably want to take it. Uh, what else is there to say about the matchup? Cavern of Souls is pretty good against us. It won't show up all the time because they really don't run too many, but it is something to think about. Counter spells aren't great in this matchup because of Vial and Cavern. Between the two of them, they probably have 5-6 to six in the deck. Spreading Seas is another thing that you need to watch out for when you fetch. Be very careful. I recommend not ever, if you can help it, getting Island Stomping Ground on two lands, because that's just asking to end up with two islands and be cut off of... Well, that's nine. That's another seven. Another two, so you'll be cut off of 18 spells that way. Oh, you can cast Dismember I regardlessly. You're going to be cut off of almost a third of your deck, 17 spells, and that's bad. That is exceedingly bad. If you can help it, do not get Stomping Ground Island. I'm partial to Steam Vents Forest, but Breeding Pool Mountain also isn't so bad. Um, What is there to say about this matchup? If you can Spell Snare or Spreading Seas, you probably want to, because that Spell Snare isn't super likely to be able to counter any Lords. Although, it is entirely possible that they don't have the Vial or the Cavern, so maybe you don't. Spreading Seas is definitely good though, because Island Walk is going to be turned on anyway, so that's not a huge deal. But it's going to hit our mana, it's definitely disruptive. The Island Walk, like I said, not a huge thing. It also cantrips for them. And, well, it's a tempo deck, so we're not always in the control role. Sometimes we are the beatdown depending on the context of both players' hands and how the game goes. But pretty often, we want to deal with their threats, play a clock, and just slowly get them. We don't usually want to race, I don't think. Or rather, we don't usually want to send bolts to the face, I think is more accurate. It is pretty often that we want to race because they do get island walk, so we can't block anyways. But we're not really wanting to race. If we could block, we probably want to, it's just that we can't, so racing is our best bet. We don't truly race though, because we still probably want to aim the disruption at them, as opposed to closing the game out as quickly as possible. I'm looking at a, a merfolk list to try to get an idea of what else you need to play around. Harbinger of the Tides is definitely relevant because it bounces things, but I don't think it's relevant enough. Maybe you don't want to swing with your Delver of Secrets before it transforms so that they don't get to bounce it, but that's not a huge deal. You're giving up an amount of damage anyways, and you don't even know if it's going to transform next turn. Uh, Curse Catcher, like I said, is definitely something you need to play around. If they have an Aether Vial on 1, definitely consider the possibility that they're going to Vial in a Curse Catcher and totally ruin the instant or sorcery you're going to play. 
that makes sequencing very important. Always be conscious of that. Uh, Harbinger of the Tides, like I mentioned, except it's also more important when they have Aether Vial on 2, because that means they can do it on your turn, even in combat, after you declare attacks. So that makes combat math very tricky. This is a matchup where combat math is pretty hard to do. Obviously, watch out for the Lords. Those are another good combat trick. If they have Vial on 2, they Vial in a Lord on your turn after you attack. And then maybe they'll ambush one of your creatures and you'll get an unfavorable trade. Or maybe they attack. You decided the turn before that you want to race. Turns out they have a sneaky Lord of Atlantis on your end step. And then bam, their team is buffed. Maybe you're going to lose that race. Master of the Pearl Trident is definitely relevant, but it's not something you can really... Master of the Pearl Trident is the Lord. I'm thinking Master of Waves. Definitely relevant, not something you can really play around because your red spells can't aim at it. But if you have the choice, I'd say save Dismember and Vapor Snag for this. Send the bolts at the other creatures first if you have both disruptive elements at the ready. It's also possible you want to save the bolt effects because those can go to face. But once again, that's a call you have to make based on how you think the game is going. Master of Waves can make a lot of tokens, so it is really good. It's a very good way for them to close the game. Chump, Goyfs, and if they get enough, they can even soak up all the Mandrills damage you have. So that's definitely something to be worried about. I'm seeing that they sometimes run Vendillion Click, but I don't think that's very common. So I think that just about covers the main deck. Most of their disruption is in the form of their creatures, like I said, Tidebinder Mage, Harbinger of the Tides. They also have Mirror Regery, which can tap down your creatures. Another thing you need to be cognizant of. Uh, their non-creature disruption is usually Dismember and Vapor Snag. Sometimes they run things like Echoing Truth, which is definitely a card you need to be concerned with. Uh, that's just about it for the main deck. Let's sideboard to wrap this up. Let's take a look at our sideboard. So, some notable things that we're going to want are Ancient Grudge and Destructive Revelry. Artifact Hate is quite nice against Merfolk because, like I said earlier, Aether Vial is one of their best cards. If they have an Aether Vial, chances are the game is going to be a lot harder for us because they're going to be able to get ahead so far on tempo and it really makes it difficult for us to really make any tempo positive plays bouncing something with vapor snag taking out a lord with bolt it's not that meaningful when they basically get to cast two spells a turn where the second one's free and uncounterable so generally we want to have some way to take out an aether vial engineered explosives i actually really like in this matchup this card's in our sideboard for the Death Shadow Jet decks. Uh, originally, I believe it started seeing a lot of play. Well, I, I mean, Engineered Explosives is a great card, so people have been playing it for a while. But when Jund became very good... Well, okay, no, I'm... Once again, that's not accurate at all, because Jund has been very good for a while. When losing to Jund because they have Tarmogoyfs became a big thing when we started running a lot of Revelers... That's when Engineered Explosives became more popular in this deck. When we could chain Revelers and Traverses, it was pretty hard to be ground out by the mid-range decks, but most people are aware that Rug traditionally has a pretty hard time against Tarmogoyfs in um, destroying them is difficult when we do slight amounts of damage and occasionally bounce things. So fatties are tough for us to answer, and even if we draw... 3 off of a Reveler, find a Traverse, play a couple cards, Traverse, get another Reveler, do it again, get something like a 4 or 5 for 1 out of that combined. The opponent can just clock us with a 6-7 Goyf and we will be chumping it. So if we weren't able to do a lot of damage in the early to mid game, that Goyf is probably going to take us down before we can take it out. So, Engineer Explosives has been here for the Tarmogoyf decks, the Death Shadow decks more recently. That's one of the main reasons people are still running it, even though there are no Revelers to be found here. Being ground out is a much bigger concern these days, 
but you don't see that much control in mid-range, so it's kind of okay. Death Shadow is still kind of mid-range, but it's more somewhere in the aggro control spectrum than I would say a hard mid-range deck. Um, EE is great against Merfolk. It takes out Aether Vial. It takes out Lords. A lot of Merfolk's creatures cost 2 mana. And for 4 mana, we can EE them all away. Even over 2 turns. It's amazing. This card will allow such blowouts if you get it. Um, if you see a lot of Merfolk, I recommend playing more of these. Engineered Explosives is really good against them. It can feel bad to use it on a Vile because you're spending 3 mana to stop their 1 mana play, but that Aether Vile is going to make way more than 1 mana worth of tempo, so that's probably still a good idea. Unless you want to save it for the Lords, but once again, that's all up to your discretion. Ceremonious Rejection is not a card I would bring in. It counters Aether Vile, which... I mean, we did just bring in three cards talking about how they're good against Aether Vial, but this stops only Aether Vial, whereas Revelry can sometimes hit a Spreading Seas, and EE hits all sorts of things, basically everything but Master of Waves. Ceremonious Rejection only hits Aether Vial, and you need it while Aether Vial is on the stack. It's too likely to be a dead card. I wouldn't bring them in. Blood Moon isn't great against a deck that runs something like 15 basic islands. You can turn off Mutavaults and Cavern of Souls, and I guess the occasional Ouroboro Palace in the Clouds, I think it's called, which is basically just an island that untaps under Choke. And I guess it's either that one, or Mikoro Koro School at Water's Edge that also can bounce things. I'm not entirely sure. Um, We don't want Blood Moon. They don't run nearly enough non-basics for it to do just about anything. Turning off Mutavault is not enough incentive. I'm iffy on the Spell Snare. When I run two Spell Snares, I was checking out the previous time I played against Merfolk. When I had two Spell Snares in the deck, I actually boarded out one of them. So I don't know if I want this boarded in. It counters Spreading Seas, and if they don't have Vile, sometimes it can also counter Lords. Which is super relevant, but I don't know if we're going to count on them not having Vile. Maybe us boarding in Vile Destruction is worth having Spell Snare, I'm not sure. Vapor Snag seems pretty iffy, I don't really like it. Staticaster is a card I don't like in this matchup. Um, Silvergill Adept and Curse Catcher, I believe, are the only one toughness creatures in their deck, besides Master of Waves, which has Pro Red. So they're basically the only thing Staticaster is going after. You could go after Master of Waves Elemental Tokens, but, I mean, that seems a little niche. Uh, one of the main things Staticaster can do is team up with a Forked Bolt or a Tarfire to take out a 3 Toughness creature, which is definitely relevant, but I don't think it's good enough for 3 mana. So I don't like that. Pyroclasm is something I'm quite fond of because it's a sweeper. Sweepers are generally good against aggro decks. Pyroclasm notably isn't great against Merfolk in the sense that Master of Waves has pro red and their lords will often grow a lot of creatures to 3 toughness. Having a sweeper is still very good. You can team it up with a forked bolt, maybe some combat. Um, oftentimes it's still great. They don't always have a lord. Our removal is generally aimed at the lords. So if you can bolt a Lord of Atlantis on their end step, and then Pyroclasm away the rest of their board. That's probably a good spot to be in. It very notably kills Kira Great Glass Spinner. Kira is a spirit, does not get buffed by any of the lords, which is great, and has two toughness. Its ability only works when a creature is being targeted, and thankfully sweepers do not target, so you can Pyroclasm away Kira, and any other weenies it's protecting, which is fantastic. One thing I didn't mention is if they have a single lord and a bunch of otherwise two toughness creatures, Pyroclasm will do two damage to everything, state-based actions will get rid of the lord, state-based actions will see that the rest of the merfolk went back to two toughness, have two damage on them, and they're going to hit the bin too, which is very important to notice. Huntmaster is a card I love in this matchup. Huntmaster is a card I love against just about every aggro deck there is. Uh, four mana is a lot. The life gain isn't always good because Merfolk can make obscene amounts of power. 
a uh, couple lords, a few fish. They'll get island walk. It's going to be bad. The bodies also aren't always great because they're just two twos and they won't always be able to block. But Huntmaster is still probably the best we have. It's still a pretty good card. It comes in, it makes some bodies, it gains some life. It threatens to machine gun things down when it transforms into Ravager. Even if they have a Kira, you can bolt the Kira. Let the Kira counter the bolt. Have Huntmaster's trigger target the Kira. And then Kira won't be able to counter the trigger. Which is important because you want to sequence it like that so that the two damage goes upstairs. Uh, I could see not wanting to do that for whatever reason depending on the board state. But usually that's what I find myself doing. If I have a Huntmaster transforming, a Kira on their side, and I have a Bolt Effect in hand. Um, that's about it. These cards are pretty bad. These ones are at least somewhat acceptable. I could see them coming in. Dismember is really good because it kills just about everything, and it can take out Master of Waves, which is something a lot of our removal doesn't do. So I am very big on Dismember here. Vapor Snag gets a similar nod because it temporarily, at least, removes tough, high toughness creatures and gets around pro red, so I'm considering the second. Let's see how we're going to board. A number of thought scours are going to have to come out, at least two, probably the third. We're going to leave it here for now. I think having only two traverse makes me want to keep both, but we're going to have to play that by ear. A number of mana leak are going to come out. Um, I don't want to play Aether Vile Cavern of Souls Roulette. I usually take out one, two, maybe even three mana leaks against Banteldrazi. They have Cavern of Souls and they can find it pretty reliably with Ancient Stirrings. I often call it Cavern Roulette when you leave in mana leaks because if they have the Cavern, mana leak sucks. If they don't have the Cavern, mana leak is basically our best card. So it's a lot like Roulette, whereas it's all up to chance. Um, given that we only have two mana leaks, I could see only taking out the one. Mana Leak is still a pretty good card. If they don't have Cavern or Aether Vial, it's going to do some good work. And it can still counter other spells that aren't creatures, which is notable. Disrupting Shoal is a way to get around Aether Vial because we can do it on their turn before even playing a land, which is handy. It also counters Vapor Snag, which is at least somewhat notable. Can get a Spreading Seas if you're willing to ditch another Shoal, a Leak, or a Snapcaster Mage. So that's important. I do feel like we're going to end up cutting at least one of these, probably two, depending on how the rest of our board goes. Knuckle Blade's getting cut. I'm really surprised that I didn't cut this the last time I played against Merfolk. Knuckle Blade looks really bad here. It's probably not blocking. Tidebinder Mage can tap it down pretty easily. I mean, they're probably going to want to tap down Goyf or Mandrills, maybe even a Huntmaster. Huntmaster at least gets value when it enters the battlefield and still can transform, even when it can't untap. Knuckleblade does basically nothing while it's tapped. I guess we could bounce it back to our hand and try to play it again. That's a lot of tempo loss against a fellow tempo deck. I don't really think I like it, and the biggest thing I see against Savage Knuckleblade is Merfolk plays four copies of Spreading Seas. Savage Knuckleblade is really color intensive. It's green, blue, red. We need to hit at least three land drops, have each land be able to produce a different color. Island, Island, Stomping Ground's not going to do it. Island, Stomping Ground... Okay, Island, Stomping Ground, anything but Island does do it. Breeding, pa breeding Pool, Forest Island, that kind of thing. It's not super likely, but it is possible. But with Spreading Seas, it becomes really likely that even if we get good mana, Breeding Pool, Stomping Ground, Island, that's my favorite way to get three lands because you have double blue, double green, single red. I've said this plenty of times. If they Spreading Seas your Stomping Ground, we're out of a red source. That's not great. We won't be able to cast Nux. They run four of those. I don't think they sideboard in Seas Claim against us, but I could theoretically see it. I really don't want Knuckle Blade in my deck. We're cutting at least one Hooting Mandrills. They often board into Relic of Progenitus, which means we don't want to be too graveyard heavy. Although, unfortunately, we can't really not be graveyard heavy. That's just what our deck is. But at least we can lighten the load. I could see boarding out a second Mandrills. I'm not sure about it. 
we have at least five cards cut here. We want to bring in at least seven. That means a minimum of two more need to come in. And then we have to look at boarding in more cards. Now let's look at how good Disrupting Shoal is at this point. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one CMC blue cards. Nothing's hiding on the side. For Shoal to counter an Aether Vial or a Vapor Snag without paying blue, blue X, where X would be one, we need to have one of nine. Oh, I, I forgot Delver. That's 13. One of 13, one CMC blue cards. Nine is atrocious. 13 might pass, but we need to cut at least more two at least two more cards and unless we're cutting mandrills bobble traverse they're going to be blue and i don't really want to cut the mana leak or one of the snapcaster mages so they're going to be one cmc basically we're either cutting shoal or we're cutting cards that we want to be pitching to shoal which doesn't feel great i mean 12 one cmc blue cards isn't awful you aren't that likely to have one in your opener at that point though I'm going off of the Frank Karsten article about uh, how many lands you need in your deck. You need, he says, about 14 untapped sources of a color to be able to have one realistically on turn one. I think with like a 90, maybe a 95% chance, including mulligans. So we are below 90-95 at having a 1 CMC blue card to pitch to Shoal with taking mulligans into account so we could that includes being on six or five cards at which point shoal isn't looking that great so i'm pretty okay with cutting it now we've got these that's great do i want vapor snag or spell snare um hmm it's pretty important to note that if this was an actual match i would have been out of time probably two sideboarding allotments ago but that's okay because i'm really just walking through everything very slowly trying to analyze as much as i can so basically is this thought scour this mandrills better than spell snare and vapor snag i'm pretty okay with only having the one spell snare it's not really cavern roulette in the sense that mana leak is because it still gets spreading seas which is nice i just don't really want it I mean, maybe over Thought Scour. But then is the Spell Snare better than Vapor Snag? I think it is. I don't think we need the third Vapor Snag slash Dismember effect. So I'm pretty okay with throwing the Vapor Snag back. Do we want Spell Snare over one of these two cards? This is a rough decision. I think it's also easily defensible to cut a one of Stubborn Denial in this matchup. Probably less often if you're on the draw, sorry, less often if you're on the play because you can go turn one, blue source, or fetch land and denial an aether vial, which is pretty relevant. So I think denial is definitely better on the play. It's possible you keep three on the play, cut one on the draw to bring in spell snare because spell snare gets better on the draw. So I don't hate that. I've never actually gotten into play draw outside of I think burn. But I don't think I've done a burn video yet. I don't remember. Anyways, so this is probably the first time we're doing it. If we are on the play, I think this is the 60 I'm going to keep. Uh, I kind of like having the one of Thought Scour because I do expect them to have a Relic of Progenitus. So I do want to have some fuel for the graveyard. I'm expecting them to wipe it at some point. And on top of that, we need a certain amount of cantrips. They're going after our mana with Spreading Seas. We have Huntmaster, we have EE, we have some relatively mana intensive cards, and I don't want to go too low on cantrips. If Merfolk was a little more interactive, I'd be more likely to do that, but unfortunately, Merfolk is basically, I mean, it's a tempo deck, but it's a fish deck, so it's maybe a little closer to aggro than people usually call it. It can be very aggressive. Murfo can kill you pretty quickly if you stumble. Um, because most of its disruptive elements are creatures, it can. Pr I think it can clock you pretty quickly. I don't want to go too low on cantrips, so I'm going to keep the Thought Scour in. I'm going to say this is the 60 I would run on the draw, 
and on on the play this is what i would run on the play and on the draw i could see cutting a denial for a spell snare on the draw spreading seas gets a lot better against us so i could see spell snare being a consideration there as well and it definitely helps you catch up if they just try to play a two drop on two without using the aether vial which they're pretty likely to do if they're not stumbling on lands because aether vial is only going to be at one at that point although definitely be aware that if aether vial is on one like i mentioned earlier in the video they can vial in a curse catcher to counter your spell but what are you going to do at that point you're going to not try to counter their very important two drop because they might counter your counter trying to counter their very important two drop you're going to go for it anyways thank you all for watching i hope this video is at least somewhat helpful merfolk's the kind of matchup in which i can't give really solid advice because i wouldn't even say my record's that great although i've never actually looked at it merfolk's a pretty tricky matchup probably one of the trickiest we have uh you basically have to be on your toes the entire time thinking about who's the beatdown, how to sequence it's very skill intensive and i'm sure i've made mistakes all over the place when playing it so hopefully this is at least somewhat helpful to somebody maybe it's just entertaining if this entertains you that's fantastic and hopefully in the subsequent videos in this playlist i take at least some of this advice to heart because those are all up already so i very well probably made plenty of mistakes or even contradicted some of the theories I went over here. So hopefully I don't look like too much of an idiot. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you all enjoyed this video. And I don't think I usually do the sign off in these. But I hope to see you in the next one.